I want to start with a, a quote from someone a hundred years ago. His name is G.K. Chesterton. He was a British philosopher and theologian, and he said this. He said, the true soldier fights not because he hates what is in front of him, but because he loves what is behind him. When you look at the impact, the wake of impact of the life of Jesus Christ, one could liken it unto starting a war. No doubt, there was a missional movement that God himself initiated, but the sinful hearts of man are like that drowning person who begins to attack their rescuer. They rejected, by and large, the message of the Son of God. Jesus and his followers met so much opposition, it seems as though every page there is a new obstacle. But they also had incredible perseverance and resiliency to continue to bring the good news message of the gospel to all of mankind. And surely, what we find from those who are most devoted is that they were those who most loved the Lord. Each of his men would eventually die for the cause, and there's one follower of Jesus in particular that we get a glimpse of this kind of devotion that would lead to a battle that would actually lead to paying the ultimate price. It would be a man who would say these famous words, he must increase, but I must decrease. And that man would be John the Baptist, who we meet this morning in our study of God's word. So I want to invite you to grab your Bible, turn over to Mark chapter number six. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one on a seat nearby you, and you can turn to page 690. Matthew and Mark, this is our verse-by-verse -verse study of the gospel of Mark, and this morning we find ourselves in Mark chapter number six with the death of John the Baptist. You follow along as I'll read, and I'll read our text of consideration this morning before we walk back through it in a little more detail. Mark chapter number 6, beginning in verse 14, and remember, friends, these are God's words for us this morning. It says, King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he is Elijah, and others said he is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John whom I beheaded has been raised, for it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man and kept him safe. He kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed and yet he heard him gladly. Verse 21. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give to you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. But because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. These are God's words for us. May they do what they do and not return void. At this point in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is about a year into his three-year public ministry. So far, he has proclaimed the Gospel message. He has done many mighty works and miracles, and he has set his heart to train up his replacements, namely the 12 disciples. And in this case, these 12, well, let me just say it this way, Jesus had his work cut out for him. Earlier this spring, I signed up to coach youth soccer with two of my children, and I knew what to expect with my kids, but then I, re I meet the rest of the bunch, 
And I mean, I'm telling you, we take 10 minutes to get on the line. We're on our heads instead of on our feet. We're picking up the ball and throwing it. And I look over on the other field, and no joke, Pele's son is a seven-year-old doing bicycle kicks, right? Like sometimes you end up with just a bunch of kids. We had fun. It was a great time of soccer and for my patients. But as Jesus works with these men, sometimes it's just a little cringy, isn't it? You just kind of grit your teeth and say, Peter, don't say that. Oh, John, you shouldn't have gone there, man. He's got somewhat of a ragtag bunch of ordinary Joes with an incredible mission ahead of them. Jesus' intentionality bounces off the pages, though, of trying to train and shape these men because Jesus knows one day he will be gone. And it will be these 12 who will follow in his stead, not to build an organization, not to make a business with a prophet, but to spread the glory of God through the vehicle of the kingdom of God in and through the gospel. That was the mission that Jesus was training his men for, that they would be the mouthpieces of the good news message that their salvation offered to all who would believe. And that message was to start in Jerusalem and then Judea, and then to the ends of the earth. Now, this would seem like a simple task, but like many things, the complexity is in the details. Chapter after chapter, his disciples are there for it, though. They're experiencing, they're watching, they're learning, and at times they are stumbling. Friends, can you imagine being one of the 12? Getting to walk with Jesus for three years of constant revelation, constant glory and power on display? I mean, truly, the privilege of an entire redemptive history was theirs. And yet at the same time, I can only imagine at times humiliation. We can read now with clarity that sometimes their questions uh, reveal some level of ignorance and naivety. But Jesus, here's the point, is so patient, so calculated, so intentional to develop the convictions and the beliefs of his men even amidst opposition. Just by way of quick review, at the beginning of Mark chapter 6, Jesus went home and that homecoming was spoiled as he was rejected even in his hometown. And by the way, his disciples are there for it. Then the next paragraph, Jesus sent them out with a warning that you too will face opposition. Just as I was opposed and rejected in my own hometown, you're going to go out and at times you're going to have to shake the dust off of your feet. And now as we get to the next story, the next organized thought from Mark and the Holy Spirit, we get to meet a unique individual, an important man who experienced great opposition and ultimately an untimely death. And I believe, friends, that what God would have for us here in 2024 on this morning is a lesson in what's involved in following Jesus. Beyond the historical account of John the Baptist or even the 12, there is a truth for all disciples of Jesus extending to us that really fills out our big idea for this morning, and it's this. It's that when I join the mission of Christ, it comes with great sacrifice, but an even greater final reward. That's true, isn't it? Joining the mission of Christ requires sacrifice, friends. There is sacrifice. It will be costly. And as we will see this morning, it may even cost us the ultimate price of life itself. But what I want to land on by the end of our time in the Word this morning is that the reward is so, so sweet and so worth it. And so let's look back at this. We'll go through this line by line and we'll see a few components of what is involved in that sacrifice this morning. But if you look back at chapter 6, verse 14, it says King Herod had heard of it. Heard of what? Heard of this missional movement of Jesus and his men because Jesus' name was becoming renowned. And what we see in these first two verses is that there are three opinions of who this man Jesus actually is. It says, first, some thought that he was John the Baptist. Some thought that he was Elijah, and others thought that he was a prophet. At this point, John has already died, so some thought maybe it's John. Others thought it is uh, uh, Elijah because it was promised that Elijah would return to prepare the way for the Messiah, and others still the prophets. What's interesting is had they listened (laughs) to the message of John the Baptist, they would have known. John claimed to be the final prophet. John claimed to be the forerunner of the Messiah, the fulfillment of the role of Elijah, And it would have brought clarity, but they missed that. And so it says in verse 16 that when Herod heard 
of it, being the fame of Jesus and his missional movement, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. Herod was convinced that his sins were coming back to haunt him. Not really based on evidence, but simply based on a guilty conscience, we get to see a little bit of the inside thought life of Herod. But this really begs the question, who are these characters? And I know some of you are new to church. You haven't been in church for a hot minute, and we're so glad you're here this morning. Let me tell you a little bit about both Herod and John the Baptist. So first, who is John the Baptist? Well, I'll stay up the, at the out front. He uh, was not declaring his denominational preference in this. There's not a John the Baptist and a John the Presbyterian and a John the Evangelical Free and a John the Methodist. Not that, no, he is actually a special person who baptized people in preparation for the Messiah. We first met John back in Mark chapter 1. He shows up right at the beginning. He appeared in the wilderness in verse 4, proclaiming a baptism of repentance. Now, what we learn about John is that as a young boy, he was born to an older priest, and he took a Nazarite vow, a Nazarite vow to be fully devoted to the Lord and to his work. What this meant is that John would never cut his hair. He didn't have time for hairstyles. He would never touch or come near any sort of alcoholic drink. He would not savor food. He was all in on God for 30 years. Because of that Nazarite vow, it's no wonder that this man, John the Baptist, when he started his public ministry, came out like a bolt of lightning. It caused a stir. He had been preparing for this for a long time. But you need to know, John was kind of a crazy looking fellow as well. The Bible says that he wore camel's hair as a covering, kind of like a ghillie suit. He had a long hair, long beard, and then a camel's cloak, if you will, with a leather belt. He only ate locusts and honey, which would lead you to believe that he is halfway on his way to crazy. I mean, this was the reputation of the man, John the Baptist. But what you need to know is that John the Baptist was a special, special servant of the Lord. He proclaimed the gospel message that Messiah has come and it is time to repent and believe. The scriptures would say that he brings mountains low and valleys high because he's leveling out the hearts of people's souls. He's leveling the soil, if you will, of their their souls so that they might receive the gospel message upon the appearance of Christ. John the Baptist was the forerunner of Messiah. So looking at Mark chapter six, this is the man that Herod would eventually kill. Which begs the question, secondly, is who is Herod? Well, you have to go back to the time when Jesus was born to first meet Herod the Great. And Herod the Great was an evil, wicked man. Remember, he's trying to kill all the babies in the land. After Herod the Great, the kingdom divides into four parts. And this Herod, Herod Antipas, is one of those four. Now, we know a lot about this Herod uh, and not a lot of good. (laughs) He's a particularly evil wicked sort of man, not a great guy. He's known for his luxurious living, for his laziness, and for his lust. In fact, we know that Herod Antipas allured his half-brother Philip's wife to leave him in marriage and instead to get married to him. Uh, Turns out, by the way, that that doesn't exactly create peaceful family gatherings around the holidays when you do something like that. And you think your family life is messy, Uh, The Herod's household was chaos, pure havoc, because of their sin. And so this is who Herod Antipas is. And what we find, just to home back in on the text, is that Herod has a guilty conscience. He has a guilty conscience. He says in 16, surely it's John whom I beheaded who has been raised. Now what Mark's going to do is take us back in time to the time before John was killed and give us a little bit of a biography on this man, John. And what we find about John is that John is a total savage. Look at verse 18. It says, John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Does that make more sense now? Now that you understand what's going on, Herod had stolen his half-brother's wife. This was against the law of God. This was against the will of God, the intent of God, the plan of God. And John is no respecter of persons. John has zero fear of man in his heart. He's rock solid, committed to the Lord. John has no concern even for his own life. What we find is that John had an unshakable confidence in the word of God, friends. 
And this is where I want to implicate us now this morning. For us as followers of Christ as well, what's to be expected when I join Christ's mission is that I need to be ready, like John, here's our first consideration this morning, to hold an unwavering commitment to the truth. And I might add, regardless of who you're standing in front of. If we are to follow Christ, if we are to serve Christ and be on mission with Christ and for Christ in a similar way, we, like John, will need to be ready to hold an unwavering commitment to the truth. And as I mentioned, I believe that Herod's conscience was the heart of the matter, and likewise, John's conscience is what led him to this uncompromising or unwavering commitment. Now, just a quick little uh, story about the conscience. I'm going to take you back to fifth grade. We're in Bozeman, Montana. We've got 10 or 11-year-old Matt Tebow who does not have the Holy Spirit in his life yet. And so what do fifth grade boys do when you do sleepovers in the middle of the winter in Montana? Uh, Rebellious and bad things. Not that bad. But we snuck out one night of my friend's house uh, not to go steal anything, not to go commit crimes, but to do the little petty thing called ding-dong ditching. What is ding-dong ditching? Not recommending this. You ring the doorbell, you run away. It's totally annoying, somewhat innocent, but still probably not good. And so one night we're out, we ring a doorbell, we take off running, and we circle back around to just see, like, did we get to him? Did we get him to wake up? And uh, as we approach from the side, an alleyway, to get eyes on the house, I realize there's something on top of this guy's truck. And I realize the guy who owns the house is laying prone on top of his pickup looking for us three little twerps. So immediately I say to my two buddies, Harley and LD, I say, guys, hit the ground, hit the ground. And so we lay on the ground and we're laying there and this guy, you can tell he's just scanning the neighborhood. It's like 2 a.m., totally silent. And he looks at us and he holds still. And he starts to crawl off of his pickup and walk toward us. And then all of a sudden, he starts to sprint toward us, and he starts shouting, I see you, little. I say, guys, run. And so we get up, and we run. And you need to know, I played shortstop and hardly played center field. We're out of there. LD was our catcher. He was our catcher. And he goes to pivot and run, and he slips, and he falls. Well, Harley and I are five blocks away before we realize, where is LD? He's not with us. And in your fifth grade mind, you start to think about the worst possible scenarios. This guy's got him. He's in his basement. LD's gone. We're never going to see LD again. So we start to walk back to LD's house to go tell his mom what happened. And instead of (laughs) just confessing the truth, we start devising a lie. And we start thinking about, okay, here's what we're going to tell his mom. We've got the whole thing planned out. Praise the Lord. Right before we get to LD's house, we meet LD. Turns out the guy just shook him and said, don't ever do that again, or I'm calling the cops. But as we get to LD's house, his mom had gotten up and locked the door. I mean, this is a true story. I'm not making this up. So we're trying to like pick the lock, fifth graders trying to pick the lock. And one of us, I won't name who, but it might've been me, leans against the wall and rings the doorbell. (laughs) Up comes LD's mom and now we're on and we're in the spotlight. And in the moment, to my shame, I just rehearsed what we'd been rehearsing. We told the lie as to why we were out and what happened. Well, the next morning, LD's Good and pure conscience got the best of him. He broke. He told his mom the whole story. Immediately, she gets on the phone, calls my mom, tells her the whole story. And uh, I never saw LD again. I never saw light again. I never got any good. No, I was grounded and in big, big trouble. The point is this. In that moment, LD's conscience operated properly. Mine did not. And So it is for us, friends, in our Christian life. God has given you a conscience. He has given you a conscience which is the moral framework of right and wrong. Romans 2 says that he has written on every heart an awareness of the law of God. And we have the choice, as we see in these two characters in Mark chapter 6, to either respond in faith and repentance to our conscience or, like Herod, to ignore it to ignore it. On this day, I believe Herod is convicted. Herod's conscience is alerting him. This is John the Baptist who is coming back to haunt me, and he had the opportunity, just as each of us do, to respond to the prickling and the pricking of the Spirit in faith and repentance. But on this day, what we find with Herod is the death of a conscience the death of a conscience. John's conscience was so filled out and so informed by the word of God, he could do nothing else but speak. And by the way, the verb there, it says that he was continually, ongoingly saying to Herod, verse 18, he had been saying to Herod, this is not right. This is not right, Herod. 
John's conscience operated in alignment with the truth. Herod's did not. And friends, here's the lesson for us. When you feel the Spirit prompting you, when you know that something is wrong or something is right, and you choose to go the other way, you are putting yourself in a dangerous, dangerous place. There is such a thing of suppressing the conscience. There is such a thing as numbing your conscience, even hardening, even searing your conscience. And as we will find in the life of Herod later on, by the end of his life, there was no inkling of faith left. Friends, if the Spirit is after you about something, can I just implore you, as your friend and as a pastor here, respond in faith and repentance. If you're convicted that something is sin, listen to that. Search the scriptures, consult with others, but it is so critical to operate in faith and repentance and sensitivity when God is at work in us. Here's the point. John was operating in alignment with his conscience and alignment with the truth. Why? Because he had an unwavering commitment to the truth. And if we're going to follow Christ, if we're going to join in the mission with Christ, we will have to do the same. Tracking with that? Can you say amen? Amen. amen. All right, great. This is what it looks like first. But second, as we look at John's life, not only did John have this kind of unwavering commitment to truth and to speaking it, but that truth had actually infiltrated and percolated down to impact his entire life. His entire life. What it looks like to join in on Christ's mission, secondly, is that I must live with an uncompromising character in my life. And if you look at verse 19, we meet Herod's wife that he stole from his half-brother Philip, and it says that Herodias had a grudge against him, John the Baptist, and wanted to put him to death, but she could not. We meet here what you could liken unto the real villain of the story. Herod is no innocent bystander, but Herodias is altogether bad news. Together, they're like the New Testament version of the Old Testament, Ahab and Jezebel. And by the way, since we've got a lot of uh, families pregnant, moms caring with child right now, moms, just a word of advice, do not put Jezebel on your top list of names if you have a daughter. And if that doesn't mean anything to you, just take it by faith. You don't want to name your daughter after this woman, Jezebel. This woman, Jezebel, was bad news, and in the same way, Herodias is wicked. She wants to kill John, and she's thwarted from doing that. It says in verse 20, because Herod feared John and kept him safe. He kept him safe. Now, what would cause Herod, the most powerful man in the land, whose life is marked by luxury and by laziness and by lust, what would cause Herod to fear this wild, halfway to crazy man in the wilderness who literally wears camel's hair and eats locusts and honey? Well, I don't think he feared him because of his appearance, though he would have good reason to. I don't think he feared him because John was powerful or was uniquely dangerous, but what we find is that Herod feared John because of his purity, because of his goodness, because of his holiness. As someone once said, for the wicked, goodness is an awful thing. Goodness is an awful thing. And one commentator said, even the most degraded of men recognize the moral authority of goodness. And so John is respected by, if you will, Herod, the ruler of the whole land. But let's get this straight for a minute and wrap our minds around this. Herod does not recognize Christ as Messiah. He does not recognize the Hebrew scriptures as the word of God. He doesn't even bow his knee to Yahweh. And yet you're telling me that the one thing he can't deny is an authentic faith that is lived out in John the Baptist. Isn't that an outstanding example for us today, friends? of the power of a fully surrendered life? That when we live with just some level of goodness and moral purity, that it is actually an indictment to the world around us? There are powerful effects from this man's life out in the wilderness, even all the way up to the very top of the government. John's moral fiber was so tangible and his faith was so undeniable that it had an impact on Herod's soul. The text says in verse 20 that when Herod heard John, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. Get this, so convinced and compelled was Herod by the life of John the Baptist that he was willing to even put a wedge in his own marriage because of it. 
right? He's willing to protect John from his crazy wife Herodias. And uh, I just had to think, man, there's a proverb, Proverbs 21. Can you imagine what their home life was like? I mean, no one probably knew the words of Proverbs 21 verse 9 better than Herod when it says, it is better to live in a corner of a housetop than to share a house with a quarrelsome wife. I mean, this guy had family issues, right? He's driving a wedge in their marriage to defend a man that he won't even submit to his message. It says he kept John safe. Returning to John, though, friends, I don't want us to miss, what an uncompromising character. You have to be inspired by John's simple obedience to the Lord. When John decided to say yes to God's calling, yes, he had an, a, a committed, uh, uncompromising commitment to God's truth, but he also lived a life of integrity before the Lord. And Christian, today, listen, I want to talk to you for a moment. If you feel like you are not doing enough, if you feel like, man, Lord, there's got to be more for me. What are the steps I have to do to earn your acceptance? Can I just tell you, these two simple things are enough? A commitment to God's word and a commitment to live with holiness and in obedience is actually pleasing to God. Think about this. John never did a single miracle. John never preached to thousands and started his own church and became the pastor. John never even went on a mission trip, unless you count the Jordan River, which barely counts. And yet, it is this man, it is this man, if you want to learn a lesson about what pleases God, this man who had a simple commitment to the truth of God's word and to living a life of genuine integrity and authentic faith, it is this man who Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, that among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Some of you feel like you need to keep doing more that you haven't earned God's acceptance, that you haven't done enough to receive his grace and his acceptance of your life. And can I just say this? Praise God that that success and significance in God's eyes aren't measured by statistics. Success and significance in God's eyes are not measured by a stat line, friends. If we would do a simple survey of the stat line of John the Baptist, here's what it would read. Number of years of ministry, one. Number of followers, zero because he gave them all away. Uh, Number of days doing absolutely nothing, at least 365, because his last year he would sit in a cold, dark dungeon by himself. Number of verses devoted to him in the Bible, 17, but only three about his life, 14 about his death. And his mode of death would be an obscure beheading. No valiant battle, no huge funeral, no dignity. And yet this is the one that Jesus said, there's no one greater. There's no one greater. Guys, I don't know about you, but isn't that hopeful for us? This is the man that Jesus bestowed the honor of being the greatest ever born of women. And he lived a simple life of obedience. Jesus doesn't measure the faithfulness of our life by the produce of it or by the fruitfulness of it. I used to love stats as a kid. I used to memorize NFL and NBA and MLB stats. I played video games and studied baseball cards. And I had more digits in my mind probably than an accountant going into a CPA exam. But here's the point, friends. Isn't it great that our life is more than just a stat sheet? That when we get to heaven, God doesn't say, well, let's see here, young fellow. Uh, Hopefully old fellow. Um, How many Bible studies did you lead? How many times did you read through the whole Bible? How many people did you share the gospel with? How many prayers did you pray? That's not how it's going to go. Praise the Lord that heaven's gates aren't like a stat sheet, friends, but it is based on our relationship in faith by his grace to the Lord Jesus Christ. What God wants from us this morning through the life of John the Baptist, I believe, is a genuine, authentic faith that is lived out in the pursuit of godly character for his glory. What was John's reputation according to the text? His reputation was that he was, in verse 20, a righteous and a holy man. So, church family and guests alike, I want to give you an assignment real quick. I want you to think about and write down what is your besetting sin? What is the thing that is jamming you up, that is tripping you up, that is limiting you? What is the thing that is keeping you from this kind of life of pure and simple devotion to Christ? What is your one area where you are constantly tempted to compromise and go back on? Rather than just doing more to earn God's favor, what I want us to focus on is actually a place of simple devotion from the heart that says, Lord, 
I'm turning everything over to you. With my whole heart, Lord God, I want to surrender and follow you. And then as you identify that sin this morning in your heart, hopefully written down somewhere, I want to just gently encourage you to declare war on it. To make an all-out declaration of war on sin in your life for God's sake and for Christ's sake and for the mission's sake, for the church's sake and friends, for your sake. That you would say, Lord, I want to be inspired by the example of John, a simple man who feared the Lord, who lived a holy life, who was righteous, fully devoted to you, Lord, would you use me in the same way? This morning, the Lord bids you to turn your whole life over to him with a renewed passion and a desire to live an uncompromising life. Because like John, friends, here's the the hard reality this morning, is that the Christian life involves sacrifice. The sacrifice of saying, I will be a man or a woman of the book committed to the truth. The sacrifice of living a life that is truly uncompromising, with full integrity. And those two are prerequisites and necessary for this third and perhaps most difficult truth for us this morning, that when we say yes to following the Lord, and when we say yes to his mission, we need to be ready to face unjust circumstances and potentially even death. If we re-enter Mark chapter 6 in verse 21, it says, an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders, Let me just be crystal clear, this is a bad scene. This is not PG, it's probably not even PG-13. Birthday parties at this level were excuses for all kinds of lewdness, of immorality, of sin. There was excess of food, excess of drink, excess of immorality and entertainment. And in verse 22, he calls his daughter in, which we think is probably his stepdaughter, and she danced. It would be normal for there to be hired dancers. And again, purely entertainment, purely lust, purely sin. What's abnormal is Herod to have his own stepdaughter do this. It's just sick. It's sick at every level. His one goal is to entertain his guests, to wow them, to create laughter and lust. And in response to her dance, he says two different times, ask of me and I'll give it to you. Whatever you want, up to half my kingdom. This is more about appeasing and impressing his guests there than it is about his stepdaughter. But as we'll see, this is going to come back to bite him. With a slight nod to the Old Testament story of Esther, he offers up to half the kingdom, and yet not for good intentions. And as we saw, the daughter goes away and asks her mom. Verse 24, she asks her mother, what should I ask? And we see the real head of the serpent The mom goes right for the throat. She says, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist. Upon hearing this, the king is nauseous. He's, uh, you can understand, exceedingly sorry, verse 26. The only other time this phrase is used in our New Testaments is to describe Jesus' anguish in the garden. His stomach is in knots. Why? Because he actually likes John the Baptist. He knows John the Baptist is from God. He can't deny the way John's life has been lived out before him. And he can't even deny the message John has proclaimed. But now, he's at a crossroads. Herod is at the all-time pinnacle of the conflict of interest in his mind and in his conscience. Because if he goes back on his promise, his reputation, his status, his respect, and ultimately his power will be threatened because of the onlooking guests. And so what does he do? He violates that initial prickling of the conscience and he succumbs to the pressure of sin. For fear of man, for desire for status, to impress people and maintain power, he extinguishes the last flicker of faith in his soul. Verse 27 says, immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head, and John was beheaded. In the lower parts, of a fortress near the Dead Sea, John the Baptist, the greatest man born of women, Jesus would say, was quietly, discreetly beheaded. It's impossible to put into words how much of a tragedy this is, how much of a heinous crime, pure evil. So impactful was this on Jesus, actually. In Matthew 14, it would say that when Jesus heard the news, he actually isolated himself. He was deeply stirred. Think about this from Jesus' perspective. John the Baptist was his cousin. This was his childhood friend. They grew up together, no doubt. They were the same age. 
Jesus, no doubt, doesn't question God's sovereignty, but that doesn't do away with the fact that Jesus felt grief within himself. He felt sadness due to the loss of a family member and a friend. But friends, the reality that I want us to see this morning is that while God is near for comfort in the midst of hardship and in the midst of loss, it doesn't mean that he'll always remove us or shelter us from experiencing hardship and suffering and loss. And guys, what I want to close with this morning is really this sobering spiritual reality, perhaps the most sobering, that following Jesus could actually cost you your life. It's wild to think about, isn't it, that simple faith in the Son of God who created every single one of us by pledging my allegiance to and putting my faith in that Son of God who loves us, who died for us, who offers salvation to us, that simple faith could actually be the thing that declares war on humanity around us. That your commitment to Christ could actually incite some sort of anger from other people who are also made by God in the image of God, even aggression towards you. Isn't that kind of wild? And yet that is what is in each of us. The sinfulness of man makes no sense. It rebels against even our good and powerful God. If there's a theme in Mark so far, though, it's that service to the Lord is going to come at a sacrifice. It's that discipleship with Jesus may actually result in detriment and even death. What John the Baptist Uh, story, what his life, what his ultimate death tells us is that there should be a new standard and a new expectation for what fully devoted disciples of Christ should expect. Jesus would say in a few chapters in Mark 8, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus warned us of this all over the place, friends. He said, if they hated me, they'll hate you. In this world, you will have troubles. He said, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. And Paul later on would say, yes, there's an open door for ministry, but there are many adversaries. There is a real cost, friends, affiliated with this. A real cost. This is not easy believism. This is not better your life, upgrade your life, level up, promote. There's a cost. There is a sacrifice to following Christ. I want to take you to just one other passage as we close and move toward our learning to live. If you'll turn to Luke chapter 14, and I'll put it on the screen as well, Jesus would teach there with two illustrations the importance of counting the cost before signing away your life to him. Matthew, Mark, and then Luke chapter 14, and we'll jump into the middle of this story, this pericope on the cost of discipleship. Luke 14, verse 28, Jesus says, for which of you Desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation is, and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Verse 31, or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he will send a delegation and ask for terms of peace. Here's the punchline, verse 33. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Friends, I want you to understand that we are in a culture that is trying to just pump people through a system. They're trying to do anything they can with a bait and switch, with lightening the gospel, with making the entry uh, easier and the bar lower to just get them in the door and stamp them and get them in the water and count the number. And this is so opposite of how Jesus taught what it is to follow him. Jesus actually said, you should spend some time and think about this. This is going to cost you something. There's going to be a sacrifice involved in this. In fact, it may even cost you your very life. What Jesus is doing is setting appropriate expectations. And friends, if we learn something from the life of John the Baptist, I'll tell you what the Lord has been working on me this week. It's as though there is a still and small whisper in my ear, Matt, what did you expect? What did you expect when you said yes to following Jesus? What did you expect when you said yes to serving Jesus? When you said yes to the calling to be a pastor or the calling to start a new church, what did you expect? Did you think it was gonna be like Disneyland? (laughs) 
Did you think it was going to be like happy plastic people and everything's going to be awesome? When you, and now I'm asking you, when you came into the church, did you expect that there would be no hard things, no hurt feelings, no sinners? Newsflash, guys, we're a bunch of sinners, amen? This room's full of a bunch of sinners, including this one here. If you expected following Christ and being part of his church to be easy, there's no doubt you're going to be disappointed. You're going to be disappointed and discouraged. But if you understand, friends, that you actually, like me, deserve judgment because of our sin, one sin is enough to disqualify us. If you understand that you deserve God's wrath, but because of his mercy that is new every single day, you stand in his grace, if you understand that reality, then you possess a joy that can never be robbed or taken. Isn't that good news this morning? You see, the beautiful thing about the gospel is it recalibrates our expectations. When I expect judgment and I realize I receive mercy, then a little bit of hardship, it's no big deal. I've got the joy of the Lord. I've got the gospel that resonates in my soul and a promise of heaven that is yet to come. And if we learn one thing from John's life, it's that sometimes things maybe go as we did not expect, but you know what's encouraging? God's kingdom plan didn't stop. When John the, the Baptist was beheaded, it's not like the whole thing was over. In fact, if anything, John's life and his death simply foreshadow an even greater crime, an even greater evil, a more atrocious tragedy that would be the killing of the Son of God. In just a few years from this time, men with anger in their hearts, gritting their teeth, would put their Savior, the Son of God, sent for the world upon a cross, and they would kill him. They'd murder him. You want to talk about a pure act of evil. There's never been more of an act of evil than killing the sinless and perfect Son of God. And yet the irony is this. By attempting to do away with Jesus, these sinful men actually accomplished the plan of the Father set forth from before time. They actually fulfilled his very plan to deliver a race, to deliver a people of every tongue, tribe, and nation for God's glory, for himself. The plan of God was that the Son of God would die by the hands of men in order to save men from their sin. Isn't that poetic and beautiful? Like John, friends, and like Christ, when we follow him, we need to be ready to face injustices, Life is not fair, then you die. That's what my high school coach used to say. We need to be ready for that and potentially one day even be willing to face death by following Jesus. Let me give you just a few things to jot down before we close in prayer here. Uh, these can be helpful to think about this afternoon in the week, to talk about it in groups. We call them learning to live. I want to ask first, have I sacrificed for Christ? I'm not looking for a list of credentials, not looking for a resume but I just want you to think about uh, what have I given up in following Jesus? Or has my expression of Christianity been really, really easy? Jesus would make it clear all through the Gospels, you're either in or you're out, right? You're either with me or you're against me. You can't love the world and me. You can't love money and me. In our day and age, you can't be a fan of the Vikings and the Packers. You gotta choose, right? You gotta choose, friends. And I wanna ask, have you chosen to follow Jesus? Have you left behind your old life in sacrifice to follow Jesus? It leads to a second question, which I'm going to warn you is deep. It's heavy, but it's important. And I want to ask, am I ready to die? Am I ready to die? The Lord may tarry. The Lord may be gracious and allow us all to live until we're 120 years old. But he may not. Can I encourage you for a moment that there is a death beyond just our physical death. Passing on from this life to the next is not the worst way that we can die. The Bible has what's called the second death as well. And I love the way that the reformer Martin Luther put it. He said, you're either born once and you die twice, or you're born twice and you die once. Friends, if you're born again, if the Spirit of God is at, in residence within you, then you have no fear of death. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? If you've been born again, then we simply pass from this life to the next and we're promoted, actually. But if you've not received by faith the Son of God as your personal Lord and Savior, then you are in a dangerous place and you are not ready for death. And I beg you, I encourage you this morning to bow the knee to Jesus, to acknowledge your sin, to confess it, to turn from it with repentance, and to place your whole confidence and trust in his finished work, the Son of God, 
who paid the full penalty for our sin. May we be a church that is progressively more and more ready to die and willing to at any moment's notice. And third and finally, I want to ask this encouraging question. Am I looking to his reward? After this morning, you may be wondering, is this even worth it? Seems like a lot of hard, a lot of sacrifice, a lot of talk about death this morning. Guys, can I just say, yes, it is. It is worth it. It is so worth it. I think we don't spend enough time thinking about and meditating upon heaven, but the reality is is that though life is hard and there will be trouble, there will be a day where we will be exalted into glory with the Lord himself. There's no need for a son because he is the son. There's no more pain, no more tears, no more sorrows. There is only glory and infinite amounts of it. That is our promise and our future reward, friends. And because of God's love that is better than life, my lips will glorify you. When our eyes are fixed on the grandeur of heaven, everything else becomes so small. Do you agree with that? Friends, I want to encourage you. Thinking about the life of John, look to heaven's glory. This life is but a vapor. It is here and then it's gone. But when we pass on from now to then, there is a psalm that resonates true. Psalm 116, verse 15, that says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. My prayer for us, Doxa Church, is that one day we would die well and bring great glory to God as we're received into heaven. Would you bow your heads and close with me?